Hello. In this programme, David Watson and I are going to be looking at the question of following Jesus. Christians believe that their business is to be a disciple of Jesus. The invitation to follow him is quite simple and straightforward, but to be a disciple can prove to be very hard. The mission of Jesus depends on disciples who are prepared to follow him whatever the cost. Think of it in this way, no matter how attractive or just a cause may appear to be, unless ordinary people get excited and begin to work for the cause, it'll soon disappear. The enormous number of mass movements in the 20th century, be they political, social or religious, have all relied largely on the effort and sacrifice of their followers, who've often, I might say, put Christ's followers to shame. The mission of Jesus Christ in the world doesn't rely on church buildings, famous Christians, evangelistic events, or even Christian literature, although all these things are useful. The mission of Christ depends upon the faithful, everyday discipleship of ordinary Christians. So what is a disciple? In the time of Jesus, disciples were people who chose a spiritual teacher for themselves whose teaching they would study. They would provide for his daily needs, and he would train them to become teachers themselves. However, Jesus departed from this pattern by calling 12 particular people to follow him. In choosing his 12 disciples, Jesus was not setting out to form a religious club full of people who already agree with each other. On the contrary, some members of the group would have been violently opposed to each other before becoming disciples of Jesus. Simon the Zealot, for example, belonged to a revolutionary group dedicated to the overthrow of the Roman occupiers by violence. He would hardly have been pleased by Jesus' choice of Matthew as his fellow disciple. Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans, a collaborator of the worst sort. Jesus' choice of these two men also shows that he accepted people who were far from perfect. Jesus went up into the hills and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, son of Zebedee and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. We've got to trust him, Thomas. Why are you making that bodkin? Man, that's Peter. What else? Well, let me spare you the trouble. Here, take mine. I've no use for it. And neither of you. Oh, <laughs> very amusing. It'll be all over. Fishing, mending nets, pushing the boats out. Yeah, Bartholomew's right. And how do we make a living, eh? What do we eat? We're eating now. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, hmm? And the next day? How do we eat if we don't work? We shall eat. What's the matter with you? Here we are, hand-picked followers of the new king, the messiah, the saviour Israel's been waiting for for generations, and Thomas worries about tomorrow's breakfast. You I do. Keep your voice down. We'll all have something to worry about. Yes, well, I was never a zealot, Simon. But Just Thomas... a practical man with practical needs, but and a man listen. should earn his keep. We shall earn our keep. Matthew's given up more than any of us. He's rich. He's not worried about tomorrow. Well, I don't really know what he expects of us. But the usual thing is for a man to choose his own teacher. It didn't happen like that. Yes. Why did he choose us? Oh, what's a fisherman like me got to do with a, a tax collector like Matthew? Or a dangerous zealot like Simon? He chose us to follow him. We're going to perform miracles, heal the sick, preach the kingdom of God. And starve in the wilderness for 40 days and nights, or I don't know that I can. He won't expect us to do that, will he? But he did it. And if we're to follow we him... We follow him. 
I've always been a fisherman, Peter, like you. But he said forsake I'm it. prepared to forsake it. he didn't it. say be prepared to forsake it. He said forsake it. And my family. Your family, your house, your, your things, your life. Well, that's all very well, but... No buts, Thomas. We've got to trust him. We've got to. Being a disciple of Jesus is really quite a tough challenge, isn't it? I mean, at one stage, Jesus actually says, if anyone comes to me who doesn't hate his parents, his family, even his life, then he cannot be a disciple of mine. I mean, that's quite a statement to make, isn't it? Well, obviously, yes, yeah, sometimes Jesus said things in a very shocking way that we might try and remember his sayings. And what he meant by that was not that, of course, we should hate our parents or families or anything like that, but our love for Jesus should be so unquestionably first that our love for our nearest and dearest is almost like hatred in comparison. Of course, we're not to reject our friends or hate our families at all, but when it comes to a question of loyalties, Jesus must come first. Mm, but don't you think that kind of loyalty can lead to um, things like uh, those cults that actually set people against their parents? I think you can give that impression because the cults often use the words of Jesus, and that's why one may be tempted to think that. But basically what Jesus was saying about our attitude to families follows on from the Old Testament command that we should honor our father and our mother. Many of the cults, on the other hand, take their disciples right away from friends and family and neighborhood, even country. And then the disciples of those cults are tremendously vulnerable and utterly dependent upon the cults. Whereas a Christian is called to follow Christ just where he or she lives and works. We're not to hate our parents, but to love them and respect them. But still, in every area of our life, special relationships, when it comes to the crunch, Jesus must be first. Mm, so wouldn't you agree then that discipleship definitely involves a certain loss of freedom? I think the impression sometimes is given that Jesus is a bit of a dictator who takes away our freedom. He makes all the decisions and that's all there is to it. And I think it's fair to say that uh, there are some leaders, both inside and outside the church, who give that impression. But it's not really like that at all. Jesus certainly wants us to stand on our own feet. And, of course, he'll help us, but he wants us to work out what it really means to follow him in every area of our life. Now, that's not always going to be easy. Discipleship for the first Christians wasn't at all easy. And if we really choose to follow Christ, there may be all kinds of changes and painful things happening in our life. But I think in a way that discipleship should be pretty demanding. I think sometimes we come to Jesus almost as though we're doing him a good turn. You know, <laughs> here I am and I come on my own terms. I want you to clear up all the mess in my life and I don't want you to interfere with that in my life. And we have it too easy. Mm. What we've got to realize right from the start is that if God is God and if Jesus is Lord, then he must be Lord of my life. If he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. And so I think it's very important that we consider carefully the cost of following Christ. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Well, this tower is complete, and a very fine one it is too. Built by William Beckford back in the 1820s, it's called Beckford's Tower, and it's still quite a landmark here in Bath in the west of England. But you know that same William Beckford had already abandoned an earlier effort owing, shall we say, to financial problems. Way over there in Wiltshire, at a place called Fonthill Gifford, are the remains of an earlier house Beckford had owned. Originally, he'd wanted a folly built as a sham ruin. But once he got that, he wanted more and more additions built on, until in 1807 he decided it should be a permanent home. A magnificent place, the legends say. Half a million pounds, crimson silk carpets, a thousand servants. True 19th century opulence. By 1822, however, he realized his fortune wasn't going to last forever. So he sold the estate, moved here to Bath, and built this tower from which he could look back on the folly he'd left behind. But he couldn't look back on it for very long because on December the 21st, 1825, the whole place collapsed. 
The clerk of works on his deathbed had admitted leaving out a relieving arch and the whole place had been constructed without a sure foundation. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. The teachings of Jesus are rich in imagery, and sometimes he used agricultural pictures to put his points across. He once said, for instance, that anyone who starts to plough and then keeps looking back is of no use to the kingdom of God. And it is absolutely essential if you're ploughing to really concentrate on what you're doing, or else the results can be disastrous. Jesus was looking for single-minded people who would follow him without being distracted. He was looking for people who would not be ashamed or embarrassed to be seen in his company. He wanted people who would follow him wherever he went, even to the cross if necessary. However, he didn't expect them to be able to do this all at once or on their own. He spent three years with his first disciples, constantly teaching and training them to become his true followers. They made many mistakes, but gradually grew in their understanding of the nature of his mission. Being a Christian is like growing up from childhood into maturity. It's not something that we can expect to happen overnight. Jesus once described the process of becoming a Christian as new birth. We are born in a spiritual sense into God's family. We begin to experience God as our father and other Christians as members of his family. A new life has begun. However, it's no better for Christians to stay in an infant state than it would be for these young children not to learn and develop new skills. Growing up is something which takes time and has to be learned. Let me go down there. Come on, push him round. Push him round. Hard, isn't it? Twiddle him round. Let me good. As we grow up, we begin to find out more about the world in which we live. We're taught different skills and develop different abilities. And so we also develop friendships and learn about our personal relationships. By doing all this, our minds and bodies grow towards maturity. As we spend time with Christ and share his life through prayer, communion, reading the Bible and being with other Christians, we start to grow up. This might mean beginning to pray on a regular basis with a close friend. It will certainly involve looking out for the needs of other people. In a way, we become apprentices of Christ. That's exactly what Jesus did with his first disciples. After training them for some time, he sent out the twelve with a power to heal, cast out demons, and preach the good news. On another occasion, he gave this work to 70 of his followers, sending them on ahead of him in pairs. They certainly weren't ready to do this. Many of Christ's disciples didn't even understand who he was. But this on-the-job training was enormously valuable for them. Christ is able to use us in this way too, even when we feel we're not yet ready for that work. Jesus once said to his disciples, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Hello, 
Delia. Are you busy? Hello, Tina. It's my bread making day today. Mm. And uh, in here, I've got a couple of teaspoons of rock salt, and I'm just crushing those up, ready to add to the flour to give mm. the um, bread a nice flavour. Mm. David and I have been talking about discipleship on this program, and uh, I think it's a lovely analogy that Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. Yes, that's exactly right. Well, salt was something that was very familiar to the people at the time because they used a lot of salt for preserving food. They didn't have any refrigerators. And I think it's lovely the way he uses very everyday things mm. to make very profound teachings. And what do you think in, in this particular instance he was um, meaning? Was it... Well, what I think is um, the beautiful meaning of it is obviously if you don't put salt in food, it doesn't mm. have any flavour. Mm. And what he's saying is... Um, that people who are committed to the Lord mm. um, must have enough flavour to flavour the rest of the people. Mm. And this is the teaching that if salt loses its flavour, it's no good to the food. And if um, believers or Christians lose their commitment and the vitality of their faith, then they're no good to the rest of the world. So like the salt, they have to be thrown out. Mm. Put that rather strongly, actually. So what happens with the salt now? Well, the salt goes into the flour mm. over here, and then we're into another parable, and this is one of my favourite parables, being a cook, mm. and that is the parable of the leaven in the dough. So uh, the next thing that happens is in the parable, he mentions that a woman took a measure of yeast, and I've got my yeast here in its natural form, and you can see, Tina, it's only two teaspoons, mm. and that's going to leaven all through that amount of flour there, which is quite a lot. And then what you do is you mix it with water and it starts to activate because it's alive. Mm. And um, you're into the parable where a woman took a measure of yeast, put mm. it into a large measure of flour until it had worked all the way through. Mm. And this is what he's telling us about um, the kingdom, is that when the kingdom comes into us as individuals, it begins to work through us mm. and um, change us from, from being sort of very lifeless people into people that are full of life. Mm. You've got some dough here, which I think illustrates the point beautifully, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yes, it's incredible. What I've done here is I've mixed up some dough mm. that hasn't got any leaven in it, hasn't mm. got any yeast in it, and you can see it's very sort of flat mm. and heavy mm. and lifeless. Mm. Um, now here we've got the other extreme. This has got the yeast in it. Mm -hmm. And so what you would be doing once you'd work the, the yeast through is you'd be kneading the dough. Mm. And as I start to knead it, I hope that you'll be able to see the difference that this actually has become very springy. I don't know whether you can actually... Yes, I can see. See how yeah. it's it sort of, it's coming back. It's got yes. a life of its own. Do you see? It's amazing. It really is. It really is alive and it really is um, becoming very determined in its own right. And if I just give it a few more goes kneading and then just let you feel the life in it, the springiness. Oh, yes, yes. And then compared to this, yeah, dull. this is rather like me first thing in the morning, actually. Yes, yes. See, that's <laughs> life with, lifeless. That's life without the Lord, you see. No good at all. <laughs> now, what happens now is that that uh, yeast working creates air bubbles and the mm. air bubbles cause the dough, will cause the dough to rise to twice that volume and then when the dough rises and it's baked then you have a lovely light loaf and that's able to feed people mm. and we get back to the parable again you know that um, with the yeast in the flour it's able to actually go out and feed people so the spreading of the kingdom is feeding the people yes and that, that is of course where the discipleship comes into the parable, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yes. I think there can be no doubt that following Christ is a very demanding enterprise, and it's one that a lot of us could really put more effort into. Well, I think unless we really encourage one another to be disciples of Christ, then there's going to be no living church for the future. It's that important. What do you feel is the answer? In early generations, older Christians undoubtedly helped younger Christians to grow into maturity in Christ. For example, the Apostle Paul spoke of his relationship to a younger Christian, Timothy, as that of a father to a son. And we need today older Christians who are willing to encourage younger Christians to grow up into maturity into Christ. There's always a danger, of course, of following the older Christian and not Christ himself. But I think unless we follow this pattern of discipling and discipleship, then we won't have any real living church in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the vital thing is that we need today mature Christians who are actually willing to be honest enough to share their lives 
with younger Christians. Have you had first-hand experience of this? Yes, I have in various ways. For example, at the moment, I travel extensively in many parts of the world with a quite a young team of Christians, and I try and share my, my life with them, not just my teaching. In other words, we meet together, and as we work together, so Christian teaching is uh, caught and not just taught. Mm. And that's always like that. I mean, Jesus did that with his disciples. He shared his life with them. They watched him at work, and he encouraged them, and he just was with them all the time. I think that's what we need today. Really, for those who are trying to help younger Christians, I suppose there are four basic stages. First of all, I do it. Mm. Then I do it with you watching and listening and maybe helping. Next, you do it, and I'm right beside you to encourage you and to uh, give you all the support that you need. Next, you do it, and I'm standing further back, but you can come and report to me for further encouragement as, as needs be. And I find when it comes to maybe trying to help a person find Christ or praying for those who are sick or counseling people in their many different needs or leading a Bible study, this is a way in which an, another Christian, a younger Christian, can come and, as it were, watch me do it and then share with me and then they can do it and I can just gently draw back until they are doing it themselves. It begins with my experience, but then it becomes their experience. There's always a danger that uh, we may set ourselves up as the model instead of Jesus, but that seems to me to be absolutely vital that older Christians are willing to share themselves with those who are younger in the faith. I think that demands quite a lot of courage, doesn't it? Yes, it's not easy at all, and to be quite honest, I find it very threatening sharing myself. But I realize that God calls us to, to share our very lives and not just our work together. We need to be relationship oriented and not work oriented. Margaret de Carney Tafty is the wife of the Anglican Bishop of Iran. Because of their Christian work, the family were in constant danger during the revolution, and on the 6th of May 1980, their son, Bahram, was murdered in Tehran. She spoke to Susan Calland about the cost her family had paid in following Jesus. It did seem more than a human person could face, really. It's more than we think of as being what God will ask of us. But God, obviously, did need our son. And we must accept that this sacrifice was part of God's purpose for our life, for the life of the church in Iran. And we can but give him willingly into God's hand. The pain will always be there. The ache of losing uh, a person in the prime of his life. But at least we know he's safe in God's hand. And the cost is really the result of how much we can love. In fact, Christ talked about counting the cost of discipleship, didn't he? What do you think he means by this? Well, I think we've got to be quite clear that by following Jesus, it's not necessarily going to be easy, it's not necessarily going to be safe. It often is, but it isn't always. And unless we are ready at the time of difficulty um, to continue following him, then whatever we say at other times means nothing. If my husband had at the time when the trouble started in Iran, had said, oh, well, this is obviously dangerous, I'd better get out. Then all that he had preached, all that we had preached in our lives together there for 30 years would have been worthless, pointless, because it meant nothing. When the storm comes is the time that you have to show that you really mean business. Through the time you, of testing. Is, that is the time of testing. That is the time when when real growth comes, that you show that what you have said in the past, is you really meant it, you really believed it. Mm. You really believe that Christ did give of his life for us. Um, and therefore, there was no alternative. Danger doesn't, doesn't um, mean that we must just turn and run. Then is the time when we've got to stand firm. Don't you think God sometimes demands too much of us then? God gave everything for us. How could he possibly demand too much? It's our selfishness and our wanting to hang on to things that may make it look too much. But everything we have is God's. And the more we love, 
the more costly it's going to be. The cost of discipleship hasn't changed, but neither has its power. Small groups of dedicated men and women can have an astonishing effect upon their society. In the Russian Revolution of October 1917, only 1% of the Russian people believed in the ideals behind the revolution. It has been said that this revolution would never been brought about by the occasional Unid Lenin rally in Moscow. It took constant dedication and hard work. If today's church is not having a positive, powerful effect upon our society, then it is because we're not facing up to the cost of following Jesus. Jesus himself summed up the whole matter in plain words. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One aspect of this program that's really encouraged me is that following Jesus means we're on a journey. And Jesus doesn't expect us to be perfect from the word go, thank goodness. He doesn't expect us to arrive at our destination as soon as we start. And like a journey, following Jesus is a steady process. We make mistakes, take wrong turnings, but I think if we're really determined to follow him, we will grow and become mature. The key to it, I'm sure, is all in our willingness to follow Christ wherever he takes us. In the next program, David and I are going to be examining the problem of suffering and looking at God's response to it in the miracles of Jesus.